Okay, now we're going to talk about clustering basics. Now, usually when people talk about clustering, they talk about it in these very big grandiose terms that only clustering people understand. So what I'm going to attempt to do is bring this back down to earth and explain clustering in very basic terms for you. Because you know what? The basics of clustering really aren't that complicated to understand, so they shouldn't be that complicated to explain. So first we're going to talk about uh, what clustering is. Then I'm going to show you some diagrams that explain to you when you should use clustering and what it's all about. And then we're going to talk about when you shouldn't use clustering or maybe why you should reconsider if you wanted to use clustering. Not necessarily when you shouldn't, but but really more the caveats that are going to go along with it because it really does add an extra dimension to any scenario. So let's go ahead and get started. Okay, so what is clustering? Well, clustering is two basic things, right? First and foremost, it's an HA technology that you use to protect against failure. That's a very simple definition. It's also the Windows feature itself that's used to implement any one of these HA scenarios. So it's both the HA technology itself and it's also the Windows feature that you use to implement it. So when would you use clustering? Well, clustering is used to protect against two basic types of failures. Number one, a server hardware failure. So this is going to be, say, if your server loses a motherboard component or if it loses a memory stick, or if it loses a CPU. Something hardware related on the server itself actually goes out. Now the second thing that you're going to protect against is a software failure. Now this is very similar to the hardware failure, except as it says, it's a software failure. This can, any, this can be anything from uh, corrupt files to a virus to something wrong with Windows itself. It can be any number of software related issues to, you know, driver corruption, something like that, right? So you are going to protect against something going wrong either, either physically with the hardware or with the software on that server. But what you will not protect against, and you're going to see this when I go through the rest of the slides, is it will not protect against disk failure. There's absolutely no way for a cluster to protect against disk failure because the disk isn't duplicated. There is no redundancy there. You have to protect your disk at another level. Let's go ahead and take a look at a simple cluster diagram. In order to get a grasp of what a cluster is, let's talk about a server. You've got a server. The server has a disk. Just like any server, even your laptop, the laptop has a disk. Now let me ask you a question. When you have your disk inside your laptop, is your is that disk in your laptop able to be shared physically with another computer? Can another computer physically hook up to it and grab access to that disk? Of course it can't because it's the disk that belongs to that laptop. Same thing with a desktop, right? If you've got a tower under your desk, it's filled with hard drives, right? Maybe it's only got one, but right now we'll say it's filled with hard drives. And those hard drives belong to that server and that server alone. Well, that concept doesn't change when you move the disk to a SAN. When you have a SAN filled with disks and you assign those disks to a specific server, no other servers can see those disks. Only that server can see those disks. Now, you can unmount those disks and present them to another server, but while they're presented to one server, they can only be accessed by that one server. That's, of course, not to say that you can't set up shares and access them remotely. That's not the same thing, right? We're talking about physical connections and having, and, and having actual access to the disk. So with that in mind, you add another server to a cluster, right? But the only difference is that that second server has access to the disk, but only while server one doesn't have access to the disk. So if you look over there on the left, server one has access to the disk sometimes, and server two has access to the disk, disk sometimes, but never will they ever have access to the disk at the exact same time. So here's where, here's where the, the redundancy comes in. 
when server one is up and running, and I'm going to show you better slides on this later, when server one is up and running, server two is just sitting there. It doesn't have access to the disk. It doesn't have access to SQL. It has nothing. It's just sitting there waiting. We call that the passive node. Then if something happens with server one, and it doesn't even have to be something going wrong with it, right? You could just want to be performing maintenance on it. That's another thing that clusters are really good at. Not only not only protecting you from failure, but they provide high availability even when you just need to do server maintenance. So you can fail over to the next box. You can do maintenance on the you can do maintenance on the inactive node and then fail back over if you need to. So what happens if you've got this you, if you've got your services on server 1 and you fail over to server 2? Do you have to then move all of your clients over to start connecting to server 2? Absolutely not. That would kind of defeat the purpose of it being a, an HA solution, now wouldn't it? So what we do is we put in what we call a virtual instance, right? And that sits right up there. And I put a little cloud there just to kind of show you that, that the clients don't really care, right? The virtual instance sits up there in the middle and it redirects the traffic. You're going to see this again in a minute. So it redirects the traffic to the active server and therefore the clients by connecting to the VI the virtual instance and you can name it whatever you want then they're obscured from which server that they're on so it's it's a lot like cloud computing right when you connect to a SQL Azure cloud or to an Amazon cloud server you have no idea what server that your database is on you have no idea what server your VM is on all you do is you have your public address that you attach to, and they could move your database to Bangladesh for all you know, or it could be in Seattle, or it could be in Tennessee, or it could be in China, or it could be in India. You have no idea where that database is sitting at any given time. So it's the same thing, just on a much smaller scale. If you have two or four nodes in your cluster, your database could be sitting on any one of those nodes at any given time, and, your, and the clients would never know about it because all they ever connect to is the virtual instance and it gets routed to the proper machine at the proper time. So let's go ahead and look at that. So a request comes in and we're going we're gonna to look at a, at a cluster that's active on server one. So a request comes in and it connects to the virtual instance. Well, server one is active right now, so it gets routed over to server one it uses up server one's resources. It uses up server one's memory and server one's page file or whatever it's going to, whatever resources it's going to use, right? All the CPU on server one and server one owns the disk. So, so while all this is going on, what's server two doing? Well, server two is just sitting there and it's waiting. It doesn't receive any requests. It's resources or it's resource usage is at a minimum. And it certainly doesn't have access to the disk. It still has logical access to the disk through the cluster manager, but it can't see the disks. It has no idea the disks are even there. And if you were to log into that server locally, you wouldn't see any of the cluster disks presented to Windows. You would see them all on server one. So let's reverse that scenario and say, let's say that the, that the cluster is active on server two. The exact same thing happens. The client connects to the virtual instance. The virtual instance routes that now to server two because that's the active server. And what about server one? Well, server one is sitting there and it doesn't have access to the disk, but it is sitting there doing its thing. So the thing, that, the thing especially with, with the SQL clustering is while you're on your active node, you've got SQL, you've got disk, you've got everything. On the passive node, and that in this in that case that would be server one, right? Remember the passive node is the one that currently doesn't own the cluster resources. On the passive node, absolutely nothing is alive. Windows is up, of course, because it has to be if it's going to be able to fail over, but SQL is turned off and it doesn't have access to any of the disks. So you can look at this failover process, and we're going to look at that again later after we install the cluster and I show you how to do a failover. All of this is going to be a lot more clear. But 
when you fail over, it actually shuts down SQL on server two and brings ever and, and moves the disk resources up on server one and then starts up SQL. So it's literally like just bringing SQL up on a new box because that's exactly what it is. You're bringing SQL up on a new box. Now, it can take a long time to do this, right? If you've got a lot of disks and a, and a lot of memory, a lot of databases, failing over can take quite some time. So you need to be judicious with your failovers. But we'll get into more of that later. Now, what are the costs involved with clustering? Well, first and foremost, it doubles your server cost. Before, you had a single server, so you bought a single server. Now you're, now you're clustered, so you need at least two servers. So software costs can also double, because now you've got two copies of Windows, two copies of SQL, two copies of whatever else you've got installed on the box. So depending on, on your licensing, it can double your software costs. Now support costs also goes up, and this is the big one for me, because this is the one where most organizations fail. Support is made a lot more difficult when you're clustering. Now, remember I said clustering wasn't really that hard. Yes and no. What I really said was that the basics of clustering really aren't that hard to understand. And I think I've proven that here. It's really not a hard concept to understand that one box takes over the resources and then if something happens to it, another box takes over the resources. That's a very simple concept to grasp. But implementing clusters working with cluster manager, getting everything just right, getting getting all of the settings to work just right can be very difficult and there can be a lot of caveats and a lot of nuance in there. So anytime you have a problem, it can be that the problem was caused by the cluster itself. And in fact, I've seen that quite a bit where clusters are implemented incorrectly and they cause more problems than they actually solve. And of course, support costs also go up because you need specialized skills in order to support a cluster properly. You need to have, as a company, you need to have real clustering people on staff. At least one really good clustering guy needs to be on staff because if everybody just kind of knows clusters and they don't really do it that much, but they've read a few times and they've installed a couple clusters, so therefore they're, they're just going to go ahead and bull their way through a cluster install and start supporting it, you're really asking for it because, like I said a minute ago, that is the biggest issue I see with companies when they're installing clusters is not having the talent on staff to support them properly. And of course, part of that is diagnosing the problem properly. Remember a minute ago when I said that one of the biggest issues is the failover, right? You can have problems with the failover because it, it can take a long time to fail over a cluster box if you've got a large enough installation. And one of the things I've seen the most is companies that insist on failing over every time there's a problem. They don't do, they don't go through the proper troubleshooting steps. So as soon as there's a problem with a cluster database, they say, hey, let's fail over to the next node. And it's not only unnecessary, but that quite often can cause other problems as well, because you've got a whole list of resources that have to be shut down moved over and brought up on the other box. And there are a lot of touch points in there that can go wrong. So just be aware that if you go the route of clustering, not only is it expensive, but it's expensive from the hardware side, the software side, and from the support side. You're going to get the trifecta of expensive when it comes to clusters. I urge you, I'm not trying to turn you off of clusters, but I do urge you, to really consider what you need to put in a cluster for and whether or not it's actually what you need. Because quite often, I find that when a company outlines its reasons for going to a cluster, I'm, most of the time I find that it's not a cluster that they need, it's actually something else. Because they they misunderstand what a cluster does, or they, um, or they think that it's the only way to get the the end goal that they want. So buyer beware on this. Just understand that clustering is a very valid HA technology, but you should really be judicious when you implement it because a lot can go wrong and if you don't have the talent you're going to be in trouble.